So we're going to have an amazing speaker come up next, followed by a Q&A. Uh, Marina Shihe is an indigenous futurist, consultant, NGO, CEO, speaker, and author with broad experience in ITC startups, impact finance, and technology policy. She serves as the CEO of NGO Pueblo Development Condition Commission with nearly a decade in United Nations consultative status and a partner with Zia Impact, providing consulting and strategy services focused on economic development and tribal infrastructure. So come on out, Marina. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I belong to the Tewa people of the Northern Rio Grande Pueblos, Wingue. I'm married into the Pueblo of Zia, and I also come from Jewish people who came to this continent by way of Spain. Um, I'm very excited that you're all joining us this afternoon, and, and thank you all for, for being here out of respect. Um, let me figure out how to use this, this clicker. <laughs> um, Oh, there it is. Great. <laughs> so I want to share with you all why. Um, so what, what I just did is I contextualize myself in terms of our traditional protocols. For our culture, we have to tell you who we are, where we come from, and what roles we have in this world. And so sharing that with you from a, a Western perspective, this is the reason I'm, I'm qualified to be speaking to you on this topic today. Um, Alexis did a great job introducing most of my background, so I'll just share a little bit more and move on. Uh, I, I do serve on a number of United Nations um, technology commissions from decentralization to um, the UN Counterterrorism Executive Directorate. And also, I'm an appointed legislative advisor by the El Pueblo Council of Governors to so 20 native sovereign nations. Um, I've been working in startups since I felt, built my first startup out of my dorm room in 2001 in PHP and was a self-taught programmer. Um, I moved into technology policy after having worked with the U.S. Department of State in special projects in digital diplomacy. Um, I founded an incubator and accelerator in Chicago in 2012, where it was a really difficult place to have these DEI conversations and, you know, um, open doors. And I'm very thankful to see, you know, how much that has magnified over the years. So. Excellent. So, so, so that we start on the same page, um, I, I built this talk around some of the conversations that I've been having, and I, I find that a lot of people don't know who indigenous peoples are or, or what that, those words like actually mean. I think people very commonly know that indigenous means from a place, but specifically when we're speaking about indigenous peoples, this has a, a unique definition. Um, there's a working United Nations definition that states that indigenous communities, peoples, and nations are those that have historical continuity with pre-invasion and pre-colonial societies that developed on their territories, consider themselves distinct from other sectors of the society that now prevails in those territories or parts of them. They form at present non-dominant sectors of society. This, this actually is, is not necessarily a, 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 a correct phrase, but it, it's um, part of this definition. And they choose to preserve, develop, and transmit to future generations in their ancestral territories, their culture and ethnic identity on the basis um, of continued existence of peoples in existence to their own cult cultural patterns. Um, for me, I have several additions, and they are, you know, do, does this group of people retain an original identity? Um, do they pray in the same ways and language of their ancestors? Is there continuous community history, biospheric interaction, and relationships? Um, and does that continue post even displacement to the places that we come from? Um, indigenous peoples make up 5% of the global population, and we're located in nearly every country on every continent with every phenotypic and skin tone representation. Excellent. So there are currently 574 native sovereign nations that are federally recognized in the United States alone. Um, I want you to know that I speak from a U.S. indigenous perspective, but indigenous needs are global, and when we use technology to solve indigenous challenges, um, that can be anywhere in the world. We also know that these, um, using technology to solve challenges specifically, has the highest demonstrable impact, and currently in terms of philanthropy, um, we only receive 
2 to 0.5% <laughs> of philanthropy dollars per year. Moving on to what is tribal sovereignty? Um, I met a lot of people over the past few days and you know, understanding this concept is, I think, somewhat challenging if, if you're not working with it on a day-to-day -day basis. So tribal sovereignty is the ability for indigenous peoples to self-govern. It encompasses legal, cultural, political, and historical traditions that are a complex mix of indigenous and non-indigenous approaches to governance. It exists as a vanguard against forced assimilation and the loss of culture due to encroachment or dominance or attempted dominance by other cultures, ethnic groups, religion, potential national identifiers, etc. Native American people have a separate political status in this country. And tribes in what is now the United States are understood under international law as having a limited sovereignty. But this is something that we can strengthen together by assisting tribes in returning to self-sufficiency, land management stewardship, practices in traditional territories, which is land back, <laughs> and strengthening tribal economies. Tribes themselves have unique needs and histories, as well as relationships to sacred and traditional geographical sites. In the United States, tribes are understood under federal definition to be permanently economically disadvantaged. So why, why tribal sovereignty is, is very critical. This is um, uh, an image of something called the cultural iceberg. And it's very small on the screen. I apologize. You can Google this. It's, it's all over the internet. Um, but essentially, in terms of preserving and continuing our cultural life ways and um, advancing ourselves against biases that we are, are primitive or, or simple or limited when we have complex, complex cultures that have always been um, technologically advanced, carrying traditions of our past into our future. Um, we understand that um, these cultural life ways span tens of thousands of years and that um, biodiversity and cultural diversity mitigates biological risks that threaten our species as humans and all others. Um, Indigenous-led solutions, which understand all of the separate things underneath, <laughs> um, underneath this iceberg, as opposed to what's visible in surface culture. You can see that I'm wearing um, some traditional garments and some modified traditional garments. Um, but what they actually mean in terms of my culture and, and placement is, is very unique and, and not something that um, you know an outside person would understand right away. So there's um, very, very much levels to this and. Indigenous-led solutions um, via technology for exponential impact are the answer to terracide and climate catastrophe. Um, only Indigenous peoples with lived Indigenous experience, traditional appointment, and leadership are qualified to advance and steward Indigenous peoples and knowledge. But all of our relatives here in this room and, and very far beyond can collaborate, support, and help. Um, why tribal nation, nations need support in tech is that it has outsized, outsized, outsized impacts, and I can't support this enough. Um, I have these two logos here because I want to share a story that happened during the pandemic. Um, we received funds from the Schusterman Foundation to the All Pueblo Council of Governors in a, a very small micro grant, a $4,000 grant. Um, the Schusterman Foundation had been supporting frontline um, workers in health and other spaces um, and buying them lunch. And, you know, $4,000 grant is lunch for 200 people. But for our tribal nations, that $4,000 bought 20 Pueblos uh, Zoom accounts. And having elders who are non-Western and non-assimilative um, understand why they needed to move into a digital space was impossible before that point. And even at the, the brink of, of us being in complete catastrophe, we were losing a lot of tribal members. We lost um, people that we couldn't afford to lose, and we were not able to coordinate a collective response across our state in New Mexico. Um, but this $4,000 affected the lives of 60,000 people and a culture that was tens of thousands of years old. And like that is such a small amount. It is such a small amount for that size of impact. But software in a tribal community or hardware in a tribal community or digital capacity building in a tribal community will always have those kinds of impacts. When we look at digital tools to increase health outcome, Native Americans on average live 5.5 years less than Americans of all demographics. 
So looking at remote digital tools for diagnosis and, and speaking to, to doctors that we don't have in our communities and only come out maybe once every other week in some places, um, that's a really significant impact to our quality of care and the continuation of our, our lives. Um, digital uh, tools have the ability to help us reverse attrition. Um, 20, only 22% 20 of Amer Native Americans live on tribal lands. This forces assimilation and cultural loss. With tech jobs and being able to have digitally enabled remote jobs, um, you know, we're able to participate in the tech economy, which has an approximately 30% um, above market income opportunity. Native Americans face the largest wage gap disparities, highest poverty rates, and are continuously the lowest paid demographics, um, with indigenous women making on average 53% per dollar compared to a Caucasian man in the United States. Um, right now, we're still all struggling <laughs> with broadband access, um, but we receive the most uh, support from federal government for broadband access through the American Rescue Plan Act um, over the pandemic and received $2 billion in funding, which addressed about 20% of the tribal needs. So 80% of the disconnected tribes are, are still looking for those resources and support. But once that support got there, we also don't have any further capacity for you know what, what we should be doing to protect ourselves, like understanding cybersecurity. Tribes have no support on this. Understanding you know, how to build digital remote economies, tribes have no understanding of this. Um, so looking at how we can receive those opportunities, we have to understand that um, native sovereign nations are, are not a business case. Um, we have small rural and remote populations. We have smaller populations than cities. Some reservations have populations that are very spread out. Um, all native sovereign nations have lo lower income statistically. So for example, Google came in and, and did some financial skills work with some of our Pueblos. Um, they charged tribal members for that opportunity. We know that Google has um, philanthropic arms and it's um, difficult to see when you know, a large company like that sees our tribes as, as a business case for that opportunity. Um, Facebook came in to one of our Pueblos and ran robotics um, institutes for children. It was great and children loved it. And hopefully we'll have you know some future robotics engineers and, and technology professionals due to that exposure and experience. But there's no longevity to this program and it was a one-off and who knows when the next thing is, is going to come into our tribal community like this. Um, we also consistently receive training to be essentially the digital janitors of the tech world. And these roles and training c uh, create continuous disadvantage when there are free and open courses and MLOCs that our tribes should be directed to, but you know that understanding um, is just not there for most tribal members. So what we need is um, a tech soup for tribal nations. So through the Tech for Sovereignty Initiative Plan, which we're hoping to launch fully with our partners um, this summer, and I'm, I'm hopeful that we can dialogue either now or in the future. I'm, I'm open to, to all of your opinions and, and thoughts on this. Um, we, we plan to accept software and hardware donations to support tribal governments to strengthen our sovereignty um, for tribally owned enterprises and entities for tri which function as nonprofits. Um, and it's, I think it's really hard sometimes for, for non-Indigenous people to understand that anything that's tribally owned redistributes back in the community and it's this beautiful synergy that you know a, a lot of other people could experience but because we're in tribal nations we're able to have that enterprise as nonprofit strategy. Um, also supporting tribal members and tribal member owned enterprises. Um, people who live traditional lives have so much additional work. <laughs> it's like having a, a whole nother full-time job in addition to your career, in addition to you know, time with your family. Like I honestly don't know how some of our tribal members do this. Um, but being able to be more efficient and being able to be more effective through digital technologies um, is something that really opens us up to also participating in our culture and making sure that it continues. Um, so we, we also are going to be looking to accept donations for capacity building, policy and regulatory support, for mutual cooperation with our local, state, and federal neighbors, um, accepting in-kind educational and human capital support, and creating long-term sustainability for tech sector and impact philanthropy support through housing this initiative 
in a large Indian country serving partner organization and the creation of many multilateral intergovernmental and intertribal task forces. We've been speaking about this with a, a partner. I, I'm, I'm not able to disclose that yet, but um, there, the impact in Indian country when, when it comes to one of us or one of our organizations spreads out across all of Indian country and it's really tremendous. Um, so we know that tech also lowers all barriers to development with exponential impacts. So lastly, but certainly not least, <laughs> the concept of cyber sovereignty, which is something that we're also just starting to dialogue in Indian country. All native sovereign nations possess the ability to assert tribal sovereignty in cyberspace. Um, this offers us the opportunity for native sovereign nations to negotiate cyber treaties, protect tribal citizens, our cultural intellectual property, which a lot of times, you know, was taken without um, our consultation or consent, and we are not able to, to bring back through U.S. law systems, but we're able to kind of create that, that um, retention in a digital space. Um, we're able to assist, assert government to government relationships in cyberspace and also um, presents a somber opportunity for native sovereign nations to enhance independent digital economies through our relationships with our neighbors um, and the enjoyment of unique and independent regulatory environments. Um, we make our own laws in our tribal nations as sovereign nations, um, and we can effectively be partners as it applies to you know, our culture and interests to any of our neighbors. It also creates unique circumstances for the enforcement of the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People um, and um, other anti-assimilative opportunities. So thank you all so much. <laughs> Um, would you come take a seat with me? Excellent. <laughs> so I have a question for you. Um, we have just have a few minutes. Um, thank you for the wonderful presentation. Sorry I didn't tell you in advance what my question would be. <laughs> <laughs> the question is, um, we've learned a, a lot about the impacts of tech in our native communities, but what can tech learn from us? So this is, <laughs> this is a really incredible question. Um, Indigenous-led solutions in any tech sector are going to be unique, consequently, because the, our, our cultures are so radically different with how we think about the world, how we interact with the world, the way we relate to the world and each other. Um, and we have a completely non-Western perspective, so anything that's going to come from Indigenous groups as a solution or as... Um, challenges to innovation are, are going to be unique and on their own. Um, there's a great book by um, a Tewa man from San, Santa Clara Pueblo named Dr. Greg Cajete called Native Science. And he uh, asserts a, a really unique paradigm for indigenous innovation, which if you're looking at, you know, other innovation sectors and being in San Francisco, you know, this is the epicenter for it. Um, this is going to be something that you haven't seen before. And, you know, for, for indigenous peoples and, and knowing how things are within our own communities and like, this is just a really natural process. Um, and it's something that we can assert in any emerging technology, not just ones that exist today, but any to come. Um, so everything we do has that triple bottom line of, of you know, people and planet and sustainability. Um, and, you know, works, like, in, in order to work in a financial sector. Um, but, you know, it, anything in our sustainability focus is also going to have... Um, an above market capacity because we have statistically a 400% more success rate in stewarding biodiversity and sustainability opportunities as indigenous people than 95% of the remaining population. So it's really exciting to think about what those opportunities are, but we, we lack the capacity and we lack the understanding and we lack the partnerships. Um, so right now we're in an exciting place where we get to build those from the ground up. So just to close us out, um, I guess in addition to um, answering all the awesome calls to actions that you shared in your presentation. Um, I have been, I have been bringing Native youth actually to a lot of tech in the greater San Francisco Bay Area for events. And um, I always give them an opportunity to see themselves in that role. We need to be able to get kids in those spaces so that they don't feel like they can't be there. And if any of you here are in tech, uh, I would encourage you to reach out to kids 
at the high school level, and if you are trying to recruit diverse people in tech, um, at least as far as our Bay Area urban native population goes, um, it can't be um, your sophomores at top tier universities with a 4.0. Your talent is everywhere. So I would like to encourage you to really rethink some of those guidelines so that you can um, have a more diverse workplace that actually improves everything you put out. So if you want to respond to that and have the final word. Um, no, I, I, I think that's a great initiative. And um, I can't tell you how many kids from the res just need to see what exists outside of their villages and their tribal communities so that they can understand what's possible. Um, you know, we can, we can give them opportunities for these remote MLOCs and online certifications all day long, but if they don't understand how that fits into the rest of the world, and they've never seen it, they've never seen it around them, so it's really difficult for them to engage, but we can definitely lead them down those paths and create innovation like we've never seen before. Well, our time is up, so let's give a big round of applause for Marina. Thank you so much. <laughs>